Read through it as you look through certain passages, and I just want to read this passage to you as well too. You start to get a different flavor for what God is really saying. Romans 8, Romans 8 verses 1 through 15, read as follows. Listen to this. This is not on your screen. You can turn there. This is in the New Living Translation. It says this. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in the body, like bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over, over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fulfilled, satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about those things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your minds leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's law and never will. And that's why those who are still under the control of their sin nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sin nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if. You're controlled by the Spirit if. If you do what? You're controlled by the Spirit if you... Oh, what did we say? If you start every morning and every day by yielding to him your bodies, your minds, and your will. Is that what happens? No. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. And the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. Therefore, here's another therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sin nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. We've talked about that. You're relationships die, your jobs die, your hopes, your dreams die. Why? Because I'm not living and listening to the Spirit. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sin nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received the Spirit of God. When you were adopted as his children. And now we call to him Abba Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. So listen. Have you found out what was wrong in that message that that theologian wrote? Did you feel the difference between the two? Well, maybe you didn't. To have a right relationship with God, we must start the day by yielding to him our bodies, minds, and wills. Is that what the Word of God says? Okay, let me just put it to you this way. Say you start every day and you do that and you sit down with God. And you say this to him every day. And you just sit down and every day you say it to him over and over again. For apparently, many, many years, this guy did this. What does that feel like to you? Does this feel like a real relationship? All right. How many of you are married? Raise your hand. Oh, very good. A lot of you. Okay. So every morning, you're going to sit down with your wife for the next 30 years, and this is what you're going to do. Ah, honey, I think I'm supposed to say my vows to you every morning. To have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I pledge thee my faith and pledge myself to you over and over. Would that be romantic? Ladies, would you like that? Every day your husband sits you down and he says his vows to you over and over again. Ladies, what would you start to think? What'd you do yesterday? 
Where'd you mess up? Why do you feel like you have to do this every day in order to make sure that you have a right relationship? Something's not right. My problem with somebody who does this is you're not treating Jesus like he's a real person. He's real. And what was the problem with the text with the people in, in uh, the Israelites? What did they do? He said in the end of, of chapter 10, he said, All day long my hands are extended out to you, but you're a disobedient. What did he say? A disobedient and a contrary, obstinate, rebellious people. All day long. It's a real relationship he wants to have with you. And he extends out his hands to you. And he says, take hold of this relationship and have it. Take me where you're going. Let me spend my life. And you're like, no, I want to keep it religious. And I just want to say these things and bow down. Listen, some of this stuff that he says, like for the first couple of days of the week, I'm like, I yield my plans of this day to you. That's difficult to do, isn't it? Every single day, Lord, I give you control. But listen, what was happening yesterday? Were you not giving him control? Was there a problem? Was there an issue? And you just, well, what do you do then? What happens when you don't yield to the Spirit on that day? Well, what does God's Word say to do? It says clearly, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's a real relationship, not based upon your works, what you do and don't do. It's based upon him and what he did and the fact that he is living inside of you. There was this one guy who would get up and we did this thing called a quiet time. Now listen, quiet times are extremely important. When I went off to Bible college, I was doing my quiet time and I found that um, I was listening to different preachers on the radio on the way to work and then I had a New Living Bible and it's like if at lunchtime I had to sit down and start reading it and then at the end of the day I got home I just wanted to get home and lock myself in my room and start reading the Word of God and spending time in commentaries and spending time in prayer to him I did that for a year and a half and I go off to Bible college and they say you're gonna do your quiet time for 30 minutes and you only get credit for 30 minutes. And you have to write in this book every day. And then the days that you don't do your quiet time, not only do you not get credit, but we want you to go back and write in that section that you didn't write down on and say, Satan won today. Satan won today. Is that the way the relationship with God works? Is that what he's offering? He says, all day long, I'm a real person. I extend my hands out to you. I'm looking at Josh and Haley. So I'm doing their wedding, right? And I'm going through the vows, just like the ones that I read to you. And I'm ready to lead Josh in his vows. Josh, are you ready? Repeat after me. And Josh is like, nope. I decided I want to say my own vows. And this guy's not pulling out a piece of paper. He's winging it. And he looks at Haley and he starts to say, I don't know, do you remember what you said? Josh, you're on the spot in front of your new bride. Do you remember? No, you know what he said? He said, Haley, I love you. You're my everything. He goes on and on. And I said, okay, maybe I missed something here in practice, but Haley, did you, did you prepare your vows as well too? And she said, no, I'll do what's written in the script. But how do you think Haley felt? How did she feel? It was real what Josh shared with her. Josh went off the script. Why? Because Haley was real and he wanted her to know, I really love you. You're incredible. It's a real relationship we're having. This is a real life I want to share. No. Honey, sit down from now on. We're just going to, I'm going to say my vows to you every morning again. And we're going to sit down. You know what she doesn't know? She doesn't know that when I've been laying on the couch for like two hours. And studying. Trying to. Half trying to wake up. Get the coffee in me. And all of a sudden the princess bride walks down the steps. And she gets to the bottom of the steps. You know what I'm thinking to myself? There should be a little red carpet that comes out. She walks over to get her coffee, right? I want to run over to her and hug her, and I want to do that every day. 
But you know what would happen every day if I did that? You know who she is? She'd be like, come on, dude, come up with something else. Because what is going on here? I'm a real person. You're having a real relationship. And God is saying the same thing. Now listen, as I'm going through this text and I'm thinking about it this week, there's no doubt that you're going to come to a time in your life where you're going to say these words, Lord, I, I lay down my life and I give it to you. I know that, and there's a reason why. He's either going to do something in your life so positive or you're going to do something in your life so negative that you're going to say, I am off the right path and I know that he's trying to get me back. Lord, forgive me. And you're going to say those words and you're going to lay down your life and it's going to be that moment. <laughs> but growing up in Christianity, they were like, now you need to go and build a mon monument in your backyard. And every time you doubt your relationship with God, just go look at that time where you gave your life to God and look at that monument. Is that what God wants you to do? Is that what he's asking you to do? Is that the relationship you're... No, he's a real person that we're walking with. And he wants it to be real. And here's what you're going to do. At some point in time, yes, you're going to say, Lord, I present... I offer and I yield. I consecrate is what you're doing. My body to you as a living sacrifice. Whenever I go through living sacrifice, I invariably think about um, Abraham who was asked to offer, in Genesis 22, asked to offer his son. And we went over this not too long ago as a, as a sacrifice to God. And uh, I, I don't know, can you imagine being that 13-year-old? If that happened to me, I think years later, I'd wake up with nightmares like, oh, there's dad standing over me with the knife, right? <laughs> He's really, oh my, why would you even, why were you listening to God? You know, I'd have all those feelings. But listen, listen to what God says to, listen to what God said to um, Abraham. He said, do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, Abraham, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And you know what Isaac became? He became the real living sacrifice. He was the real sacrifice. But what did God do in the process? He substituted the ram for Isaac's life. Isaac was our first living sacrifice, and then Christ came. And through the resurrection, he became our second living sacrifice. And that's what God is saying to us. Uh, uh, this, is, this is what is acceptable to me. The Israelites had a real problem bringing acceptable offerings to God. Constantly throughout Scripture, they were trying to, you know, God will take this one, right? This messed up offering. And, and Listen, sacrifices were not an easy thing. People around the world who participate in these sacrifices, they read through this passage. It's not like you and me. I think it was my dad or, I don't know, maybe it was you, Pastor McGee, who was describing taking animals to the slaughterhouse. You know, they'd, and the animals, as they were going to get killed, they knew what was going on. They knew what was happening. They would make a special sound that they knew they were about to die. So I, my question is, how many of you are having steak for lunch? I don't know, just... Forget, forget what I'm saying, right? Forget real quick. But it was messy. It wasn't a fun situation. It required death and blood. And it was horrible. But here he is saying, listen, I got something new for you. It's called a living sacrifice. And I'm telling you, this is going to happen in your life. You're going to come to a place where you're going to say, God, I know you're, you're asking me to lay down my life. And God says, listen, this is acceptable. But not only that, it's holy. And when we say holy, we're, we're not just, you know, okay, let's place some special word on what you're doing so we feel good about ourselves. No. He says, this is you saying, I'm going to reserve my life for you. I'm going to set it apart. My friend Tim took his wife not too long ago um, out to dinner because it was their 20th anniversary. And uh, he called up and he made a reservation and he said, hey, it's my, it's my uh, 
wedding anniversary. We've been married for 20 years, and I'd like to reserve a table. And he got there, and uh, he said, my name is Tim Wagner. I have a reservation. They said, Mr. and Mrs. Wagner, we have, a, we have a place reserved for you. And it wasn't just a table with chairs. It was a room all for them. And they said, this is your special room, and it is completely reserved for you. And that's what God is saying. He's saying, listen, when we become his living sacrifice, we are reserving the right for God to have our life. It's going to happen. When you are led by the Spirit of God, this is what is going to take place in your life. And you're going to make this decision at some point. A living sacrifice. God says this, this is acceptable. And this is reasonable. This is a rational decision that you are making with a real God who is real. And well, how do I carry this out? Well, verse 2 goes on to say this. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't be configured. Don't be molded into this world. You're going to be in the world, but what I'm asking you to do is do not be of the world. Be in the world. You're going to be tempted. You're going to be tested, but don't be conformed. Don't be configured to what the world looks like and acts like. So in this process, be in the world, but don't be of it. And we all know people in different religious groups that are not conformed to the world. Can you think of any groups around the world, not necessarily Christian, but groups around the world that do not conform to the world. Can you think of any? Uh, that's who I thought of. The Amish. Now that's a Christian group. But I was thinking also like uh, Muslim. Muslims don't conform to this world. You know, there's, um, there's, uh, there were some Pentecostal groups certain segments of Pentecostal groups that are extremely like uh, dedicated to God and they're very separate. They're separatists and uh, they dress different. You can see them. The Amish as well, the Mennonites, they look different. You know, there's another group too. They're called the Pharisees. Did you know they did not conform to the world? So it's not sufficient just to not conform to this world, right? You can not do a lot of things and it's not what God is asking you to be and to do. He said, don't be conformed to this world. It doesn't just mean don't do a lot of stuff that, you know, I'd be disappointed in and don't look like the world. Because I got a question for the Amish, right? They don't, they don't have cars, do they? So what do they ride? Horse and buggies? But like that's not of this world. I guess it's don't be of this generation because like 150 years ago, didn't they have horse and buggies? What would they do then? Well, we, I guess we just got to carry the buggy now, right? Because we don't want to be like the world, right? I'm trying, I'm trying not to be conformed. But God says there's the way in which you go about not being conformed to the world. And how is that? To be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might find. And the end result is you get God's perfect, God's good, perfect and acceptable will. But to be transformed here is a word that means metamorphosis to be completely changed. And you think about the caterpillar and, and what it becomes. It becomes something totally different. It's not like Bug's Life, right? Well, you think about Bug's Life, you, right? Oh, you got grandkids, right? I'm a beautiful butterfly, right? Is he a butterfly? No, he's a caterpillar that got two wings attached, right? I'm a beautiful butterfly. You can't stop thinking about that. No, you're not. You're a caterpillar. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a completely new transformation. He's talking about a seed that is dead, that becomes alive. Metamorphosis. The old passes away. The old, the, oh, behold, all becomes new. There's a transformation. The old does not look to be transformed how? By the what? The renewal, the renovation is what that means. The renovation of your mind. God's word says this, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. God says, listen, don't, it's just not enough to be a nonconformist or a secondary separationist or somebody that I don't do, right? He says, no, be transformed, a new creation with a new way of thinking. One of the things we did this summer is we went through Louis Giglio's book. It was so powerful. I mean, all of you were coming up, especially Greg, it was like, uh, man, the devil's sitting at my table this week. 
I'm like, me too. Did you identify him? We could identify him so clearly. That's not God's heart. That's what Kyle would say. Is this the heart of God? Is that the message you're hearing? Is that the heart of God? No, that's not God's promises. That doesn't sound like God's promises. That's not God's message to me. But how do you do that? What you're going to do is you're going to fill yourself with the word of God. I can remember being a um, baby Christian and I was walking with God. And like I said, spending a long time with him. And uh, all of a sudden I thought, you know, this is too legalistic. I want my relationship with God to be much more organic, much more free-flowing. I'm not going to specifically read the Word of God for the next couple of days. I'm just going to live my life and kind of watch what happens. So I did that. And at the end of two days, I was like, the temptation is too great. I don't want to live like this. Lord, give me a verse. And immediately he gave me a verse. Lord, let me meditate on this verse. I need the promises that come from that verse. I need the strength that comes from I want to be transformed. I don't want to be like what I was. I want to be renovated and completely new. How many of you have gone through a renovation process in your house? How many of you are like never stop the renovation process that goes on in your house. You always have a room that is being renovated, right? Always. It's always good to, the best way to do it is to what? Rip it all down to the studs, right? Rip the flooring out, rip everything out, rip it down to the studs. That way you see what you have. And then you start to renovate. You get new drywall, brand new drywall. Not the stuff that's gonna, you know, turn to mold in the next couple of years. And then you get that stuff that, what's that crack stuff? What is it? You put it in the cracks between the two drywalls that are, it's, it's joint compound. There you go. You got to put that in there as well. So you do the renovation and you get the, the paint the way you want it. And it's new drywall. So you have to put 50 coats on, right? And then you start in another place. And my job was always the grunt label, labor, right? I'm the guy taking all the junk, the old stuff to the dumpster and putting it in. And that is not fun. Getting rid of the old is not fun. Going through the getting rid of the old in the mind is not good either. But then what do you find after a couple of years, that thing that you renovated? Oh my goodness. It's starting to get messed up again. I've got to go back and renovate this the same way in our life. God says, listen, I want you to renovate your mind. And it is constant work. It never ends. It is constant. Why? Because the temptation, the trial, the different things that you face in life require that, well, God, are you going to be the same? Well, what is God saying? What is he saying to you and me? What's his relationship? All day long, my hands are extended to you. And the question is, will we be the disobedient, contrary, obstinate people who will not reach out and say, no, Lord, I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to give it to you. I liked verse, or chapter 11 last week. Trusting in the kindness of God. What was the problem with Israel? They would not trust in the kindness of God. It always goes back. The just will live by what? By faith. And that faith begins in that trust relationship that begins right here. No! God did really say, I'm not going to let that thought in my brain. His promises are true today in this new situation. I'm going to listen to him. It requires that, and one of the things you're going to do is you're going to get into the word. The renovation that takes, and here's what happens. It's one Greek word. It says this, that you may prove what is. That's one Greek word. You know what that means? That means to positive application, through applying what we just talked about, what is God going to do? He's going to show himself to give you his will, his perfect, his pleasing, acceptable will that's going to take place in your life. But what is necessary? What's necessary is that you live in the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives inside of you, you will make choices. And it's a real relationship. It's not a fake relationship. It's genuine. He's a real person. As real as you and me. And we're to treat him as such. And trust in him as such. Make sure I got everything this morning. I don't want to be disobedient, obstinate, and contrary. I want to reach out and walk with you. 
What we've been talking about here is first in verse 1 is this. It's consecration. And the second word is transformation. One of the things that I think I hear through this passage as well too is deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. It's God's manifesto to us. It's God speaking to us saying this, listen, you can trust me. You can trust me. You can trust me with your life. And I'm real. Take my hand. I'm going to guide you in the right place. I'm going to take you to the right place. Let's all stand together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your people. As we enter into the week of Thanksgiving, I, I find myself meditating on your goodness over the last year, your kindness. And Lord, you have shown me and you continue to, to show me and those here that you're worthy of our trust. Lord, today as we enter into the season of um, the holiday season, Lord, I, I I just want to, I want to praise you for what you're going to do. I want to praise you, Lord, because <laughs> you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're the same. Your loving kindness never fails. And Lord, we want to lift that up to a world that's lost and dying. A world that is um, experiencing the wages of sin that they bring forth death. Father, we praise you. That you're more than trustworthy. You are true. Lord, be with your people this week. Lord, as we enter into the season, I know that we all have expectations. But Father, help us each day to really genuinely hold your hand and to be comforted by that. Lord, I ask that you be real to your people. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>